So I'm really curious actually, because a lot of, you know, I do enjoy kind of, it's fun to play around with the suttas when you're talking about meditation. And for a lot of people, I think it is intimidating and it brings up a lot of doubt and there's all these techniques and they don't know which one to approach. What have you found? What's your core way of teaching? How would you, um, how would you advise someone to meditate? Say it's someone who's practiced for a year or two and, um, they sort of feel a lot of doubt around what to do. Like what's sort of your catch all slash heart of your meditation that you enjoy giving to people. Thank you, Venerable. Yeah. I mean, as I said, mainly just keeping it really simple and gosh, you know, I find it's quite tempting actually to embellish or, um, you know, play with words or sort of be very, try to be, try to be very eloquent, um, giving guided meditations. There can be a temptation to try to sort of vary the instructions and, you know, make it interesting and different from last time and so forth. But actually, uh, for me, I, um, I try to keep it simple. And I do tend to encourage quite a lot uh, that people focus on the breath um, because it's such a wonderful object. And for me, it was really the doorway to um, samadhi practice. And uh, so I find, you know, I guess we all teach from our own experience, don't we? And for me, it's, uh, you know, the being able to observe the breath and to learn how to be with the breath um, this uh, incredible benefit of, you know, peaceful, calm, abiding, um, that almost everyone can experience to some extent, keeping the object very simple in this way. Um, I find that, you know, it, it's invaluable. As uh, Goenkaji would say, it's the royal road to Nibbana. <laughs> Anapanasati is the royal road to Nibbana. And... Uh, <clears throat> I, I could just totally agree with that. And not that it's the only uh, technique that can be practiced, but I, I'd always encourage people to give that a, a serious um, chance and give attention to the breath. Um, and then, you know, when people have uh, issues that come up, if there's difficulty, it'll usually be one hindrance or another or, or a combination of... <laughs> And then addressing that, addressing how, you know, how to work with the hindrances in the ways that we all know. And the Buddha spoke about the kind of remedies, the antidotes to the different hindrances, um, such as, you know, with sense desire to really look at the object of desire and to uh, yeah, break it down into its component parts and see how desirable they are or to consider, you know, what happens in 50 years' time to this desirable object, or even in a couple of days if it's something edible. <laughs> you know, where's it going? Uh, to, to consider a Nietzsche change and to consider, say, the four elements in relation to that which we desire uh, as an antidote to craving and clinging. And with aversion, you know, often, often I bring in meta practice actually early on because it's so helpful, so needed, so many of us experience um, negativity of one sort or another, aversion, irritation, anger, um, even hatred, you know, so to, to bring in meta practice almost as a kind of companion to mindfulness itself, uh, I find that increasingly that's uh, the way that I guide people. And uh, also, I, I should add that I uh, give um, quite a lot of guidance on body awareness. So bringing the breath and body awareness together, um, because so many of us, I, I certainly found myself, you know, when I started meditating, I, I really hadn't developed any kind of body awareness to any degree. It was quite shocking and surprising to realize that I was like a disembodied head, you know, thinking, 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 seeing, hearing, 
tasting, smelling, but but really not feeling uh, anything much below my neck. <laughs> you know, it was a revelation to begin to pay attention to the rest of the body and very, very helpful, very grounding, very remarkable um, to be able to do this practice of, of body scanning in one way or another. And so I generally um, bring in uh, body awareness and often in conjunction with the breath. Mm -hmm. So it, this I find for most people, it's doable. It You know, the mind will settle with an object like the breath that's moving and shifting and changing where there's this beautiful rhythm um, and grounding that in some kind of body awareness, whether it be the chest, you know, the movement in the chest as we breathe, or the belly, or the flow of the breath in the nostrils, in the throat area, whatever it is. Uh, it doesn't matter, does it? But it's whatever people can feel. Uh, so I, I bring those two together, breath and body awareness. And usually, yeah, with uh, metta, Bhavana metta practice as part of the, um, not just at the beginning or the end of a session, but as part of the mm -hmm. kind of attitude um, we have, uh, we bring to bear on our practice. Thank you. Yeah. Your, your, your laughter, by the way, embodies all three of those aspects. You have one of the best laughs I've heard in a long time. <laughs> 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 But it's uh, very bodily, a lot of metta and definitely the breath. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much appreciated hearing your uh, how you've worked with and combined these different modalities, which people can conceive of. You just read it in the in the suttas, and you know you you read you know, about Kaya Gatasati, you read about mindfulness of the body in one sutta, and then there's metta in another sutta, and there's the breath in another sutta, and people can kind of separate and keep these things distinct. So your, your comments, which I hope we can uh, go more into uh, how you've lived and uh, combined these different, seemingly different practices into one. But I'm just, in terms of the form, I'm curious, um, I mean, you've really given a number of forms of, of Buddhist practice, of spiritual practice, a really strong go. I mean, practicing the Goenka tradition for a decade or more, uh, practicing as a Sila Dara for 15 years or so, and now in the Bhikkhuni form. And I'm curious if you could, you know, in each of these forms, um, you know, might have people who that's perhaps an optimal form for. And I'm curious if you could talk about like the specific, um, maybe, speaking to someone who each of these three forms and any others that you could, um, that you've practiced within, um, speaking to someone who that for whatever comic conditions, that's the, the right form. What are the, um, the advantage or the advantages or specific characteristics of each one of these, which can be, can be helpful on one's spiritual progress? Mm. Thank you. That's a great question. Okay. Uh, let's see what comes out. <clears throat> yeah, I, I feel that the mm, Goenka form, uh, Vipassana meditation, is uh, a wonderful vehicle for lay life, you know. Um, I think, I don't know, but I imagine if I was still a lay person, I'd probably still be doing that, uh, still be part of that uh, huge, you know, global organization and giving my energy to that because it seemed to me a very good use of time because, you know, in lay life, having all sorts of responsibilities, um, work, family and so forth, then, you know, people may just have so much time for retreat and those 10-day courses are are really uh, quite intensive, as you know, uh, a very good use of time, of limited time. Um, for me, they were just tremendously um, helpful um, in developing the practice and also to enable, you know, uh, development of uh, jhana practice because the conditions are suitable for that. And that may not be the... the um, 
the ultimate freedom, uh, uh, uprooting all the defilements leading to Nirvana, but the jhana practice most definitely gives uh, insights, profound insights into the nature of reality that are that's filtered through, filtered through. Uh, the mind is not the same after having these kind of experiences. Um, they're radically transformative and in ways that I can't quite imagine <laughs> how the mind could transform otherwise. I don't know personally because this has been my experience that the insights from jhana practice have really moved me forward. So, you know, uh, I think the Goenka tradition enables a really deep practice and the conditions that allow for samadhi to develop very uh, smoothly and well. Um, so as a lay person, I, I would, for me, my, my knowledge is limited. I haven't done a Hasi technique. I haven't practiced in Burma. I haven't, uh, I've heard of many other wonderful teachers, teachings, techniques. Um, so my, my knowledge is limited, but from the little that I know, I definitely uh, would recommend the Goenka practice and technique to lay people, for lay people. Um, for monastics, I, I, yeah, I feel that, um, you know, the uh, Thai forest tradition is very inspiring and there are many great teachers within that tradition and there's great support for the monastics within that tradition, um, both from the lay community and also within the community. Um, it's just a wonderful vehicle for liberation for so many. Um, I just have huge respect for this tradition. As a, as a person with a female body, it's um, a little bit less encouraging um, in the sense that, you know, the bikuni ordination, full ordination is not really accepted widely. Um, that's quite discouraging in a way. Um, and I... I found that uh, practicing as a sila draw was, you know, I have nothing but gratitude for all those wonderful years as a sila draw. But um, something um, interesting uh, happens over time um, when one is a kind of perpetual novice. You know, it's like you, as the years roll by, you know, and you become more senior. Um, but you're not really senior, you're still really a novice, you're still really quite junior. It's There's something a bit kind of internally uh, confused or confusing. Um, and yeah, I, there was a struggle there for me. And I, I think um, I am someone who will tend to sort of stay with something probably longer than I should, actually. Uh, like just to stay with it because it's good enough. Um, but it became really over time very inexorably apparent to me that there were limitations that I couldn't cope with, I couldn't live comfortably with. And I didn't have the insight to really just recognize that for myself. But I had enough encouragement from the people around me to recognize that this wasn't working, that I was being kind of, in a way, um, I was frustrated, you know. I, I couldn't really um, smoke out the woodsheds, you know. I couldn't really, like I'd been given so much, I'd benefited so much, I, I had this energy to offer, um, that, but I couldn't do that within that form. Um, so I, I reluctantly moved on. I didn't really want to move on, but I was encouraged to do so and to take time out. And, and then once I took time out, um, it was really very quickly apparent to me that no, there was no going back. I needed to move forward and to allow myself to uh, make the most of the opportunity to take full ordination. So I think as a as a woman, um, it, it's 
for me, I would say the bikuni ordination has made a, a big difference. It's quite interesting. I wasn't expecting it to feel as powerfully healing and helping as it has, but it, it felt a bit like um, something being realigned, something that had been broken, you know, something that wasn't right. It was, it was, it was really uncomfortable, um, painful even. Uh, being able to go forth as a bhikkhuni, to be ordained by other bhikkhunis and to be part of this uh, bhikkhuni revival feels like something's clicked back into place. What a relief. And I can't really put into words the, um, the sense of happiness and well-being that I've been experiencing since taking the Upasampada, Bikuni Upasampada. So I'd recommend that. I'd recommend it to, <laughs> you know, uh, both men and women. You know, if you have this um, strong aspiration for liberation and you're willing to renounce, you know, all the worldly cares and concerns, then go for it, you know. Uh, take full ordination and allow yourself to uh, receive all the support and guidance that's right here for us, you know, in the Dhamma Vinaya. I, uh, Thank you, uh, oh, please. Arjun, did you? Yeah, just, just a quick follow up on that. Um, so you used a, a turn of phrase, which some people might not be used to. So um, like uh, smoking out the sheds, this comes up in the um, Chula, what is it? The Mahagopalaka Sutta. Uh, the Greater Cow Horde Discourse, Majima 33. And basically it's a reference to, to teaching. So basically the, the Buddha in that discourse recommends for uh, the monastics to from time to time, actually uh, it's a, a metaphor related to like stables. You smoke out the stables to realize, you know, to get rid of the, um, you know, any kind of bacteria or, you know, things that might be lurking there. So basically when you're teaching, you're putting what you know out there and you're here, you're both sharing with others and hearing what you know for yourself. So you can, okay, how clearly, how well do I actually know these things? And when you were talking earlier, you were just talking about like, what a joy the, um, you know, celebrating, being able to seeing your, your teaching as a, as a celebration, actually celebrating the Dhamma. And it seems like for you, that's um, really something which, which was missing um, in other forms. And um, I, I can be sympathetic to that. And um, yeah, I'm curious if you could uh, maybe say a little bit more about, uh, yeah, just the joys of teaching and, and your personal experience of it. I mean, I know um, there's a place like in a training monastery where the junior people are not actually put to the forefront. And there is a period of uh, not sharing the Dhamma, but what has been your experience when you actually get this opportunity to speak the Dhamma and to smoke out the sheds? Yeah, thank you, <clears throat> Ajahn. It is rather, as you said, I just so agree with you, you know, that uh, we have a chance when we share on Dharma to both offer uh, what we've received, to offer that to others, which is naturally very joyful, and also to hear ourselves speak, to, to really um, have a sense of assessing you know, the situation here, and if not just listening to ourselves, um, also receiving, you know, feedback from others, questions from others that make us search deeper and, you know, look more, you know, what is my understanding of this path? How far has it gone? Uh, how much more is there to learn? And so for me, it's like, yeah, there's a two-way process. There's both listening to teachers and learning, which is an ongoing process, and very important, of course, to have wise elders who can give us guidance, but then also to, you know, yeah, be able to um, to share what we what we do know, what we have uh, understood, or what we're exploring, uh, where our interest is in the Dharma, to actually share that with others, and hopefully, you know, encourage and inspire others. That feels like a really beautiful, um, natural process, indeed, and. Um, I must say, as a sealer, I did have opportunities to teach and a lot of encouragement and support 
in doing so. But there came a point where I was really basically asked to to either live here or or teach, but don't do both. <laughs> you can't really do both, and that's because I was spending time away teaching retreats and so forth, and it was seen as not really kind of in line with the community needs and requirements. And so I recognized that, yeah, actually, if I want to carry on in this particular form, I'm going to need to live a much more quiet life. And yeah, being part of a big community, kind of just focusing on my own practice, you know, and uh, and and looking after the, just the people around me, which is probably, uh, you know, would have been, could have been a wonderful way to practice, but it just didn't quite um, work for me. So I think we have to, at some point, recognize our limitations and our strengths and just to some extent, at least, go with those rather than, you know, battling against the tide, as it were. It's a very interesting issue, actually, because to some extent, we want to be challenging ourselves and to be developing our weaknesses. But um, yeah, my sense is that uh, the early years of monastic life are very good for really being contained and uh, following and just practicing very quietly, developing a very quiet mind and listening and learning. But then as we as the years go by, um, it feels fairly natural for me for us to express a little bit more the Dharma for others. And uh, yeah, I just felt, you know, for me, that was what needed to happen. Uh, well, I didn't really decide anything, actually. Things just happen, don't they? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I really just can only agree with you, Ajahn, that teaching is a, another step in the learning process. It's another step along the path. And it's it's simply a humble offering of the little that I have, the little that I have understood, can I share with you? We don't need to be arahants. We don't need to be um, even know fully what we're speaking about, but we can explore and we can uh, share our interest with others and we can study the suttas together. And so I, I really approach teaching in this way of, um, I consider I, I'm just sharing the Dharma, my love of the Dharma really with anyone who's kind of interested as well. Let's see what we can learn together. You know.